as Tats Crew, you were already like so far advanced in your head to go to another country is like, well, yeah, of course, because we've, we've, you know, we've, we've patterned up. We're, we're on it. Well, what was crazy for us was uh, being introduced to Buntlack. <laughs> for us, it was like a whole new world. We were like, oh. Killer, killer, podcast. Killer, killer, official .com. <laughs> you need the television app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the app store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Created. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Yes, people, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London, or central as you need to be. Killer Keller, your host. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. Hold tight, everybody, checking out the television app. You know, it's free download, street culture, and more. Uh, yeah, we're going international. Oh my gosh, you guys ain't ready for this one, but we're coming in strong. New York City, hold tight. Bio Tats Crew, what are we say, my brother? What's up, my brother? What's up, killer? <laughs> <laughs> I love it when our flag comes together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it took us a minute, but we got it. Yeah, we did. We did. What's going on in New York? Give us, give us the ground report. What's happening? Oh, man, I'm thinking, you know, still, everybody's still going on with COVID still happening, starting to slow down. But, you know, like the whole world, everything came to kind of like a standstill, just holding tight, you know, a lot of working from home situations. So, you know, hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll be back out there. I mean, I've been out there painting here and there, but I just go out to paint and then come straight back to the crib, you know? Yeah, it doesn't have the same kind of um, social aspect as it should. Or, or we no, no, it. not at all. I mean, it's all Zoom. It's all, you know, yeah. this How kind often of... Does he, this, this shit can't quite... I mean, it's it's a funny one because, you know, the, the, the blessing and the curse is we're able to conversate like this and yeah, yeah. the rest of the world know about it. But, uh, you know, in reality, it's like, uh, I, I miss those times, man. Yeah, no, no. It's, I mean, it's it's crazy. Just, you know, something you take for granted. It's a simple thing. It's just walking out the door. Now you got to walk out the door. Do I got my mask? Do I got my uh, hand sanitizer? Do I got, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have I got my sanity? I mean, it's not... <laughs> Basically. <laughs> um, New York right now. Bro, like, I don't even know where to begin with that one. Oh! <gasps> I know. I've been seeing some crazy shit. I mean, they, they're still out here, man. They have, they're going hard. You know, full 10 cars I've been seeing on video and stuff. I'm like, wow, pretty yeah. impressive. Pretty impressive. And and, and more, more to say with logistics as well. Like, these ain't, these are the sort of things you see in Hall of Fames. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just saw some, uh, recently the other day, I saw some whole car top to bottom, like full style. And I'm like, damn. <laughs> yeah, how do you get all that done in a in a layup? How, at the fuck? Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, at that point, at this point, it's just like even with like the way things are today, with so many cameras and so motion sensors and all types of things going on, the fact that people are still able to pull work off like that, it's impressive. Super impressive. I mean, yeah. It also here's the other thing for a lot of for a lot of people that like myself to a degree who weren't privy to see it directly happen back in the day there's a whole different there's a whole bunch of steps that take it takes to get to that point right and a lot of that gets uh reduced or forgotten about but when you actually see it roll the way you are online and in face to face you suddenly appreciate the moves that had to be made to get that on there yeah absolutely i mean it's just the hours of waiting the scouting locations you know, there's times where you spend hours going from one location. That location is no good. You go to another location. You got to wait for workers to leave or whatever. It's crazy. I mean, I, I haven't done it in years, but just seeing that people are still out here full-fledged is amazing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You guys started very early. I mean, you had to pick of the crop back in the day. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, back in the back in the day, we were good. You know, we go into the yard, start painting. Halfway through, halfway through, uh, just kind of walk out of the yard, go to the store, and come back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like it was just part Hold of on, you. My leg. All right, sorry about that. That was my wife. 
It's okay. This is COVID life. It's that COVID life. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, she's blending in the kitchen. I'm like, ew. <laughs> is, that your, is that your lovely lady? Yeah, she's over there. She started blending. She forgot I was on a Zoom meeting. She started blending away. <laughs> um, yeah, let's let's just jump into it, man. When did it all begin for Bayer? When did it begin, brother? I mean, for me, it's early on. You know, I grew up here in New York City, so... In the like late '79, for me is when I really got that bug. Where and I had spotted graffiti, you know, I saw it on the subways, and it was. And during those times, you know, you had all the greats painting. You know, this is what they, the heyday of the New York, you know, graph scene. So I grew up in that time. So seeing that, like you know, late '79, early '80s, when I was like, I need to jump in. So I kind of, you know, like everyone, you start out as a toy early on, just wanting to learn the ropes. And when you're a toy, nobody's going to help you. So, you know, you go and you gravitate towards other people who are learning as well. And you little bits here. And there was no like Internet back then. There was no magazines. There was none of that where you could pick up a, a book or a video and learn about this stuff. So it was really like you really had to go out and, and, and find information and get information, little bits from here and there to be able to actually start jumpstart a career in, on paint just to paint trains. That's crazy when you think about it. Who were the influences? That, who were the influences? Of me, the, the immediate ones that come to mind back I then? I mean, the, the immediate ones are, you know, the obvious ones. Don't, I mean, the ones that people see, man, you know, the Dondies, the Lees, the Scene, you know, Zephyr, the uh, Crash, Days, Shy, Cos, you know, all the rock star guys that were doing all these productions back then. You know, uh, to these... to. To people these days, those are common names that they've seen in magazines, but we didn't see these in magazines. We grew up watching these actual pieces live, you know, running. So this was our direct influence, not from a magazine, but just standing at a station and watching that car pull in with these, you know, top to bottom whole cars by scene. And you're like, damn. Damn. <laughs> damn. <laughs> I mean, it can't it can't go without saying the influence that that must have had on the whole like the whole of New York. Give me give me Sorry, like okay, now my dog is going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, quiet. This is this is this is that MTV cribs that should have happened. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he's, he's going nuts because somebody's knocking on the door. So. It's all good. It's all good. As, as, as long as yeah. the transport police are all good. <laughs> <laughs> They're tapping us in now, man. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it goes without saying the influence that went on back then. And I'm thinking, explain a little bit to me and to everyone else the the energy, the the, the landscape. Try right? if if you can create, a, give us a mental picture of of New York in it, the state it was in. As a as a youngster, and how how much of an impact those colors, those those styles, those writers had. I mean, you got to understand. Yeah, the, the landscape in New York City was just, just the whole climate of the city was you know in decay. The city had no money, no funding, so the trains obviously you know were tagged up. The streets were dirty. You had entire neighborhoods that were burnt out. You know, abandoned buildings and that sort of situation. So to see like these colorful trains was like, wow. It was like comic books were created by, you know, people from your neighborhood, even though you didn't know a lot of these artists, this was something that you related to because it was coming out of your environment. You know, you would see a dirty train followed by two more, three more dirty trains and all of a sudden, boom, a masterpiece. And you're like, whoa. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just made you want to do that. Grab it, especially if you were into art or, or something like that, you know, like for me, when I first saw it, I was like, I wanted, I didn't, I saw like this character on the train and I was like, shit, what is that? I want to do that. But I didn't know what it was. So I went back to my neighborhood and I started asking everyone. I said, yo, I, I, you know, I grew up in Bronx Road Projects and uh, I started asking people. I was like, yo, I saw some stuff on the train. They're like, oh man, that's graffiti. I was like, what's that? It was like, you got to get a name. You got to get up. I was like, then that's what I need to do. Oh, man. Were you but into you know, at the time like that? I'm sorry? Were you into art at the time like that? Was that was it a thing? Uh, no, I mean, yeah, yes and no. Like, I didn't know. I, I used to like to copy, like, the comic, like, in the newspaper. I used to have, like, different comic strips. I used to, like, try drawing the uh, characters from that. I like, even before I knew about graffiti, I like experimenting with letters. Mm. 
So it was a natural fit for me. The minute I saw that, I was like, this is what I need to, I want to do that. I didn't know what it was, but I knew I, I, knew I needed to be a part of it. Yeah, because it was so impactful and still, still right. young and everywhere. And then the crazy thing is, because at the time, you know, graffiti obviously was illegal, but considering what was going on in my neighborhood, you know, what my other friends were into at the time as we're growing up, getting more heavy into heavier crimes, graffiti actually steered me away to a different direction. Instead of saying, hey, let's go do an armed robbery, I'm going to go steal paint, you know, shoplift paint from a store and go paint trains. And that, at the time, was the lesser of the two, you know, so it's kind of like a saving grace for me. Yeah, it was sure. illegal. It was illegal, but it was something that kept me out of, you know, a, a different lifestyle. Bio, you, you touched on a really serious point, and it's one that, that comes up fairly frequently on the podcast. You know, it's that has it saved your life? Hasn't it? What could you have been doing had you not done that? And it's it's often when you see graph uh, escalate. Or rather, accelerate in the in the society and become more. It almost like changes form from a, from art to a protest, and a lot of that is about people's circumstances and the state of the of society as a whole. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Do you feel that was the case in the Bronx at the time? You like you say you you could have gone in any which direction, but it actually it saved you to be doing art instead of you know what I mean going down those other roads. Right. I mean, it was. It was a way of you as somebody young, you know, in a city existing, you know, you, it, it gave you an identity. It gave you a sense of belonging, a sense of, uh, you know, of pride. Like you start with nothing and you build up this name. And even though people don't even know your face, they, you're building up a respect for a name and you're starting to get, you know, some uh, recognition amongst your peers. And it didn't matter that the outside world or the rest of the world had no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. You existed in that little world, your community, and you were like, oh, this is the person that painted this. Boom. So now you got your little props. And, you know, that's your voice. And then, you know, obviously different artists have used their voice in different ways, as you mentioned, you know, some to speak out against injustices or whatever, some just to glorify their own name, just to, to, to belong, to be part of a movement, you know, that we didn't even consider it would become a worldwide thing, you know? Yeah, and and Graf wasn't all. It was associated with hip hop to a point. It, I think a lot of it was right place, right time for it, right? But it was yeah, it existed. Like a lot of people put it, you know, as part of hip hop, which it is. You know, it's, it's definitely you know they, they coexisted. But there was so many other graffiti artists who didn't listen to hip hop music, who were into rock music, mm. you know, skateboarding a different way of life. But it just you know, hip hop happened to be around at the time. I mean, hip hop was named, you know, the name gave it elements, you know, the, the music, the dance. But I think the way graffiti kind of got pulled in there was like, you know, the graffiti artists were the ones doing the flyers. They're the ones painting the jackets for the MCs or doing a backdrop, you know, for the party or something. So it just was all part of that culture. And, you know, that's why it's included in, you know, the element of hip hop. But it existed as as on its own prior to that, you know. Yeah, for sure. And just going back to the, the 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 source, the original kind of aesthetic and how uh how it was it was created at that time. You guys were working with some well, a lot of the writers that you grew up seeing were working with some really basic materials. It is it's a far cry from what it is now, right? <laughs> Very basic, really basic. It was like you had wet you had wet look, you had red devil, rustolem, Krylon. And these are probably the better brands. And then if each of these brands had maybe 20 colors or 30, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't a, lot, a big selection. And then in terms of caps, you basically worked with a thin cap that the can actually came with, or you would go to the supermarket and try out different caps from different products. So, you know, you try like a starch from a you know, spray starch or different, yeah. whatever caps you could take off and fit on the can. And then sometimes you modify them, you pin them out to make a fat cap. So it was very yeah. basic, you know, basic, uh, you know, tools that we used back then. Was that fun? Did you enjoy that? It was fun. I mean, you didn't, you know, the thing is, you didn't know you didn't have all the luxuries because they didn't exist. Yeah. You had everything you needed at that point. It was just a question of you learning how to master a cap 
that sprays out faster than the you know cap would today you know and that took even for for someone like myself who's been painting you know up to 40 years that transition of going from those basic caps to more modified caps to slow down pressure took an adjustment because i was like this thing sprays too slow you know it doesn't get it out as fast as i need to i'm used to working at a faster pace yeah, but, yeah you know yeah, yeah. over time you adjust it's funny you say that because you know for beatboxing right i would try different microphones and each microphone created a different density a different pot, bottom end a different top end and like you say it's very you, you know when you found something really unique and to your taste when it suddenly hits you like with impact you're like yo this this article this item this thing it's working for me it's, it's and it's crazy isn't it when you find that that thing right oh, hold on a second My, we have a house phone that never ever rings in like <laughs> in the, in the, this year <laughs> it's in the background oh uh, yeah it's, i tell you this is that crib shit <laughs> listen listen wait hold on make it better i mean let's see what else happens yeah 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 you watch this we're gonna get a mosquito <laughs> in flux or something I'm, something crazy gonna happen i'm surprised my dog hasn't jumped up I'm speak speak all right he's ready to jump in the picture <laughs> yo <laughs> oh, right, right, this, this is this is a podcast exclusive right here <laughs> come on Ruby, go down <laughs> Yeah. Oh man! Oh my goodness! Legendary, yeah, legendary podcast to make it, baby. <laughs> um, but as I was saying, yeah, you do find your tools, and and when you find something that really you feel super upgraded, that's the shit, right? Yeah, I mean, it it, it it's an evolution of you know, if you do something long enough, you know, you're gonna evolve with all the uh, new equipment. As a DJ, as an MC, it'll be new mics, new turntables. You went from turntables to Serato, you know, it's. Yeah, and, exactly. You know. But do you feel though, but do you feel like sometimes because of the uh, the products the way they are, um, I certainly feel it from time to time where um, it has this look because the products are so on the money and so on on point. I like some of the old school guys grabbing it and using it because it feels like a four wheel drive, like a super upgrade in what they ever were. And it's like, it's almost like their ideas come really come to life without any restrictions. But a lot of the time it, it feels like quite, everything has a similar kind of strength. Does that make too sense? San too sanitized or it's too polished. It's kind. Don't but you think it that doesn't have the rawness? Do you feel that? Uh, I do. I mean, the part of it, you know, the, there's, Look when you look back at some of the older paintings, or even like if you see like some of these older guys work on canvas, you see how raw it was to what they're doing today, where it's everything is very clean and sanitized. Yeah. I'm, I'm obviously you're able to create more intricate, you know, work nowadays with the caps and the paint. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a big difference. Then you and if everybody's working with the same tools, it, it becomes like all right, you know, where's the difference here? Where's the skill? Of, where's the skill if someone who's just learning how to paint can have the same level of control with a can as somebody who's been doing it for thirty years or more? Yeah, that's what kind of uh, what I'm thinking. But maybe that's that's just progression. That's just the way it is. That's what it is, man. It is because it benefits everybody else at the same time. Anybody that's got the skills over, like you say, forty years, man. Yeah, forty yeah. years. Long time. Give us tell 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 the people your first ever graph experience. How did it go down? How did bio? How did you how did you uh, manage terrible, that experience? Terrible man. I, I I did my first train I ever did. The trains was were a silver and blue at the time, and I remember I had this whole plan. I was not I was gonna do light blue and dark blue because the train the stripe on the train was dark blue. So I was like, I'll save time. I don't have to fill in that part. So I yeah. went to this layup. And I didn't even reach the window of the train. And like, you know, from standing on a track, I did it from like midway down. And it was like a mosquito bite on an elephant, right? Something that <laughs> nobody in the world would notice. And I did it blue, light blue, dark blue with black outline. And I remember waiting, waiting, waiting on the subway platform for this, you know, for days for this little thing to pass by. Yeah. And it was just not even noticeable. I remember, I think 
and the crazy thing on the other side of that car was, if I'm not mistaken, was the hand of doom that was what? painted on the other side. So, Damn. so my my little insignificant mosquito bite didn't even register on the scale of what was happening, you know. But for me, it was like the most amazing thing when I saw it go by. I was like. Oh my God, this is, I did that. Yes, yes. But it, it was insignificant. Like nobody ever, it's not something you would notice, especially when you got something like the Hand of Doom painted right. on the other side of it. Listen, Bo, some, some people would just like, that's, you with the Hand of Doom. You're, with the, you're on an you're authentic, of the moment. You couldn't even peel that off a piece of paper. That experience is... Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. I mean, you know, it's funny that you see all these trains now. You've seen them for so many years in magazines and in shows. But you remember them in a different way because you saw them, you know, whether you were walking down the street and, you you know, because in New York, we have elevated subway tracks. So whenever you would hear a train coming, you automatically would look up and just to watch the show go by, you know, just like, let's see what's new. Let's see what's on there. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And yeah, because got, you've got the bridges, right? There's a lot of bridges yeah, we got going like, on. We got all these in different sections of the cities. We have underground subway, but we also have elevated tracks. So anywhere you're walking in the street, you can kind of see, you know, the trains. The Bronx is kind of, I mean, here's the, here's the naive statement <laughs> here. The Bronx is kind of big, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty big. The Bronx is pretty big. I mean, com- compared to... Uh, Brooklyn, which is a huge borough, it, it, it's smaller, but we're it's not, you know, it's not as small as people think. Yeah. North, the south, east, west parts of the Bronx. So. Yeah, exactly. How did Tats Crew come about? Tats Crew came about, and it was, I was still in junior high school at the time, and uh, I was going to school with uh, Brim. Brim was actually, we were going to school uh, called 127 in the Bronx. The legend Brim. Born. Yeah. yeah, Brim. So Brim had this idea. He was, he started, he had met Mac, who became, a, you know, part of the crew. We even, we didn't even have a crew at that point yet. So I remember going, meeting up with Brim and Mac's building in Harlem. And once he lived around 116 somewhere, and he had this idea of a crew, TAT. And at the time, I think he, he wrote Top Art Team or something like that. And the reason we chose the, the A, it was because there was other crews like TMT, TMT. That's so we're right. like, if we put an A, you know, alphabetically, it's the first, you know, bumps you to the top of the list. That's right. So we had, so we we started, you know, putting up TAT. So the early members was, you know, Brim, myself, Mac, and another friend of ours, Bass. And that was, you know, d- during junior high school. Then when we went to high school is when, you know, the other members came on, like Nicer, BG, you know, yeah. Rash, 125th, Vol- you know, Volcan, and everybody else. Yeah. Wow, you know, I mean, what a t- so that was the early beginnings of the crew. Crazy, you know. Then years, you know, then maybe like mid '80s is when they they did uh, BBC. I think did the document. I think it was hip hop history with Bambada and stuff. And then Brim yeah. Brim, Brim actually was part of that, and they did a spinoff called Bombing, which was which is what we all know. Well. Anybody that's deep into the, the hip-hop and graffiti culture, no bombing. So we went out there, and that's where we met Goldie, you know, 3D, Mo2, like all these guys from back then who, you know, we've still been friends for many years. Mm. Well, Goldie is tats, right? Yeah, yeah, for many, many years. You know, since those, we've been friends, you know, like family since then for over, you know, 30 somewhat years. Over the last few years, he's really supported my podcast. And uh, yeah, I, I, I hold him very close to my heart. He's... he's He's a mate to me, and uh, he's, he's, a ma- he's a maniac. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's dude. <laughs> Without question, but he's like you know. To me, he epitomizes everything that the UK street culture scene represents, and he he just holds himself iconically. And it's just awesome that he's he he has his flowers, and it's it's. He it's just awesome. we uh, finished up a documentary on his life not too long ago. I don't know when they're going to show it or release it, but it's pretty good. Well, you guys did. You guys were fully fleshed in the Sky documentary recently, too, right? I think is that the one that he just did uh, on Goldie's life. Um, no, it was a Sky Sky Arts thing, all about Graf. You guys had a big jam in Miami. You did a big, big. Burn. Oh yes, 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 yes. That's the one. Boy, in Winwood that, that we were painting out in Winwood. That's right. 
I mean, Miami has changed. Art Basel and all that. It's almost like they, they haven't got enough walls to cover to want more graffiti, right? But yeah, it's crazy. It's insanity over there during that that la- that first week in December, last week in November. It's like artists from all around the world go. They just converge on the city and just like it's a madhouse. Do you feel like? Because you know, Brim really took it to the international masses. Tatch Crew became an international thing. Do you feel? Do you, a Do you feel contributive to this having happened? And B How hard was it to have been? counted in as forerunners to spread the word of your version of graffiti i mean you know what's funny at the time when you're in it it it, you don't know it's that you don't know what you're 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 just going you know obviously we went out to england to do the documentary and be part of that but then you know we painted some walls while we're out there so you don't realize at the time that what you're doing is becoming history you know yeah you know you're just existing in that moment and you're doing what you do you know you never say okay i'm doing this because i want to be recognized i want to be here you're there you're exist in that moment the present so you know years when you look back when people say no it's funny because there's a place we painted in england and i don't even remember the place and people like oh you guys painted here and I'm like, I don't even know what that area was mm. called. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> so I know we taped it, but it was like the circle by highway somewhere. And I did like the a piece with like some bombs or whatever, where we last or whatever. But I have no idea. Comment below, people. You know the deal. You know what we're doing here. That was 1985, I believe. Mad. But, and it was just, you know, crazy for us. But then, you know, looking back and then you see all these videos and photos looking back, people are like, you, you didn't know what, you know, was going to happen from then to now. Yeah, I guess it's a bit like when I think back to my gigs, my shows, yeah. it's like it's all be one big merge. You can't remember. But people hold, people hold hold it to their heart that you came through and passed the message on, didn't you? Yeah, people, expect, like for instance, somebody goes to your show. For you, it's a show. You do a show, but you don't know how your show has impacted somebody else at that point in their life. Yeah. So they have that memory of you doing this show where yours to you, and you're like, oh, I was at a show, I was doing a gig. But for them, they experienced it in a different way. They were on the receiving end of it. Yeah, it's true. It's a funny one. It's a funny one because, like you say, what you think, what, what is actually second nature to you in, in the Bronx as Tats Crew you already like so far advanced in your head to go to another country is like, well, yeah, of course, because we've, we've, you know, we've, we've patterned up, we're, we're on it. Yeah. But you know, when you came through and done what you've done, bombing the documentary, it just left it. It was just like explosive. Well, what was crazy for us was uh, being introduced to Buntlack. <laughs> for us, it was like a whole new world. We were like, oh, this is serious now. Who introduced you to Buntlack? I don't remember. I don't think like, there was only paint available that was there that we had when we were here, when we yeah. went there. And it was just so, uh, so much better quality than what we were used to using. And it's amazing. You know, it was amazing to us. It was like, man, this thing is the best. That's the shit. I had no idea that that, that it, it uh, surpassed the. the yeah, because we were, remember we were using Krylon, which was watery and stuff yeah. like that, and Rusto, which was thick. But Buntlack had the colors and the quality of like a Rustoleum, mm. and like a better color selection. So for us, it was like a whole new world. So I remember we did an event, and again we painted a wall. It was a wall, makeshift wall. It wasn't a real wall. Something gardens, uh, me, Brim, Goldie, and 3D. Okay. And we painted this wall. And that's when, you know, I had the full experience of the bunt light. And I was like, damn. <laughs> I did like a Cheech Wizard character on the piece I did there, I remember. I mean, that lineup alone is scary levels. Scary levels. Yeah, and those cro- chrome angels, they were called. It was Prime, Mode, that's Goldie, right. yeah. Goldie, me, Brim, and 3D, yeah. That was the, the lineup there. Hold tight, Mo, too. Hold tight, 3D. Wow, I mean, the, the, the journey that you guys have been on. Eras spring to mind, you know, like the Connor era of, of hip-hop. It was, you guys 
were the goat. This is how it seemed to me anyway, you know, as an onlooker for Graffitism magazine and, and the, the Odd American mag is, is you guys really did embrace the media side of it. And um, you took Graff to a whole next level with quality productions in association with brands. You know what I mean? Yeah. How was that? How did that, how did that come to, to fruition? I mean, that was just a natural evolution of what we were doing, you know. And, you know, you've painted, you've done the subways, you start painting out on walls, you start now collaborating with companies and doing work and just taking it to a different level. You're watching what's happening, believe it or not, overseas, <laughs> and you're looking at the scale of what is happening in other countries. Like, for instance, Germany started to produce like these amazing, you know, ridiculous work. And we were like, okay, so we're kind of just echoing back what we're seeing. It's funny. We, we, although we may have started earlier, we were still learning. Like to this day, we're still learning from even artists who have been doing a lot less than us, you know, because we're a lot of people. I think for me, one of the things is I don't like to stay stagnant and be like, all right, this is the style I did then. And I'm going to continue doing the same exact thing. Mm. you know i'll take a look and see what a younger guy is doing and be like all right i see what he's doing that's something that was done back then but he's doing it with a new twist you know what it reminded me of and this was only again from a musical point of view you know you guys made hold on one second yeah yeah you just... <laughs> your head going around it looks like some like 90s rave t- <laughs> music video <laughs> i've got a plug in <laughs> Ruby, go down. <laughs> this is my favorite fo- Zoom podcast ever. <laughs> it's the it's the how to make make an engaging podcast. <laughs> if you don't really graph, you're gonna love this. Um, uh, yeah, it's almost like a re-export, man. It's like as soon as as soon as you as, as soon as the UK took um took rock and roll they re-exported to you guys and it reignited an idea and and i felt like that was with germany man when they started coming out with those techniques <gasps> ridiculous ridiculous it was, it was like wow you know so again even even i mean that time when we painted with the characters that mode two was doing at the time in england in the 80s mm. it was, I, we were like damn yeah you know Without it was question. like advanced yeah it's the influences that were there, wasn't it? It's the different influences. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's just, a, you know, it's like a circle. Just, you know, each one just feeds off one another and it continues to evolve. And that's the beautiful thing about, it's the beautiful thing and it's the thing that they, they just, authorities can't get with and they, it stirs them crazy. The whole idea of like this thing, it, it, it's, it doesn't, people don't want to get paid for it. They want to do it because it's habitual. And they're influenced by other people that are doing it habitually. (laughs) Basically. You got to watch me. I'm trying to watch. I'm I'm listening to you. I'm watching my dog as he's trying to jump up here again. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. So what what effect did did the European style have on on the US as a whole? I've never asked that before. I think the, obviously... Early on, it was the difference in the paint, just simple things like the paint in England, right? Mm. Then move, moving forward, when, you know, guys in Germany started to put more emphasis on background than the actual names, where, you know, instead of the name being the focal point of what you're doing, okay. it kind of became you were putting the name into a scenery or a landscape or a backdrop or a concept. Mm-hmm. So that kind, that kind of changed for I mean, I'll speak for myself. That for myself, that for me, like in the early '90s, that kind of changed my perspective of it as too. Okay, let's let's create these theme walls. Let's create, you know, with more content, not just pieces. You know, just two names or whatever. Let's create, you know, backgrounds and add some characters and create a whole, you know, whatever going on. For sure, Lumet, Dime, Delta. These yep. characters, these people, yep, yep. Lumet for sure. Lumit. Lumit with just crazy concepts of morphing even the, the animals that he was putting his name into and shit. That was just... Yeah, little cow paintings and stuff like that. <laughs> Do you remember that one? That was crazy. Yeah, yeah. Oh. We was doing it, you know. It was different. And Dime, when he came out with his 3D style, was ridiculous, you know. Just game-changing. It was just like, how? How are you doing that? What? Yeah. yeah. And so, it just carried and, on. And, 
you know, so for, for me, it's been a funny uh, journey just watching, you know, this stuff coming from New York, growing up watching the guys in the subways to watching the movement go worldwide to still being a part of it and, you know, learning how to use the new cans, the new paint, even uh, social media, you know, having to become, you know, tech savvy to, to remain relevant. Yeah, that certainly has been the hot topic for a good three or four years. With every um, year that goes past, the strength in graffiti as an art form being on on social media strengthens. And right, I'm, I'm going to be spicy here. <laughs> It's spicy. <laughs> it's spicy with it, right? Um, when social media platforms come into play, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or whatever, you know, they come out every two or three years, or at least an upgrade on a, on a, on a platform comes out. Yeah. Um, forever this line in the sand kind of kicks in where, I don't know, like some social media platforms, like the Instagrams, they have a, a, a they have an attention space, which if the... F- you know, if the the clever um, and cunning artist gets on board to begin with, they get the most attention, which in turn makes them the forerunners of a scene. But that doesn't actually equate to their legacy. Right. A lot of people don't go on those social platforms who have a legacy because they feel like their position is strong. And often I feel like, yeah, how come people get the credit? It's it's, it's weird because on one hand, it's good for them. You know what I mean? And if you've got skills, cream rises to the top. Right. But, I often feel like that line in the sand really is detrimental to, to, to even the historical documenting that we're talking about. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I can see what you mean where you have someone who's doing a little wall in their backyard and has, you know, 100,000 followers because he's able to manipulate, you know, social media and knows his way around it, where someone who has done a lot doesn't have as may have a thousand followers you know yeah. so yeah i could see that and they're like this guy in the eyes of today's world this guy is more relevant with a hundred thousand followers than the person who's actually can put in work so i can see that but i also feel that if you know it's up to the individual to uh, again you know you cannot sit back and relax and be like all right i was the great i am 30 something years ago mm-hmm. and expect for people to fall in line, you have to put in work as well at this point, you know, and I think with the introduction of the internet and social media put pressure, I think more so on artists where the constant pressure to create, you know, before you do a wall, before internet, before, you know, all this stuff, you can paint a wall, paint something, and it would take months, you know, you would mail a photo to somebody in England, you would mail a photo to someone overseas and it would take months, Yeah, you know, for everyone to see you know, this work that you painted, Mm -hmm. that you created. But in today's world, you know, you can paint a wall today and as you're painting is live streaming. So by Wednesday, if you're painting on Monday by Wednesday, it's already old news Mm -hmm. in in this new world, you know? So you're, you're, you're forced again to go out there and create again to just to keep, you know, have content, Mm -hmm. you know, at this point it's got kind of, we've all become content providers. Essentially. Yeah. I feed the machine almost, isn't it? Feed the machine. Feed the machine. <laughs> Bio man, like, I ask you this mainly because, you know, I've been following tats for a fucking long time, boy. You're like, <laughs> I just need to be old. <laughs> um, but you've always been ahead of the curve on the tech. Oh, you know, when I think about it now, uh, you guys have, you know, you brought the, the, the TV world to graph. You, you, well, one of the guys that did that, you, you were the team that bought, um, you, you, you pioneered a lot of stuff in new media and connecting graph with the music industry as well as brands. And you've always been forward thinking like that. And your, your Instagram tells a thousand stories of the similar s- sentiment. Yeah. Um, what's the fu- What do you feel like the future is? Because, it, yeah, like I say, it just it appears to me that you were ahead of the curve. I mean, I, at this point, you know, it's, you wrote, you do what, here it is. It's not, you do what you do. The world is going to happen around you, right? So you do what you do. You feel what you do is right in your career and your, you know, whatever direction you want to move. 
So for us, it's been that, you know, when, whenever we did something, it was like th- at that point in time, it felt it was right for us to, to be doing that. Mm-hmm. You know, so today it's the same thing, you know, at this point in my career, yes, I still do the graph, but I don't know if you can see, there's a background picture behind me at this point, you know, a lot of work on canvas. And if you're listening, you know, he's got a badass background canvas thing going on behind him. You, you know, so it's yeah. more about, yes, we've, we've produced thousands and thousands of work, but a lot, a lot of that work has been lost. It only lives in photos. So at yeah. this point, in our career is more about painting canvas and preserving, you know, as much of the work as we can. Yeah. That's a, and that's really important. Have you got into the NFT thing yet? No, I have no idea what that is. I see what I'm saying. This is about where I'm talking about staying relevant and knowing what's going on for the past two weeks. I've been like, what, the, what is this? I need to figure it out. She's just about to get crazy on, on, you know, on crypto, you know, this whole NFT thing, get your, you know, your design, get your, you can have audio with the design, you can make it animate. And, you know, this is like, it's like trump cards from back in the day, top trunk, you know, baseball cards. It's, but it's people, on. people purchase these and hold them on and they live yeah. on their computer or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, to, to explain it on one, it, it, honestly, it's deep, it's, it's deep like the abyss, but it's, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, bro. The, the game is going to change and, yo, that's what I'm saying. I'm seeing, I'm seeing this and I'm like, okay, uh, I feel lost. I feel lost right now. I need yeah. to grasp what's going on. That's why I've been looking. So if somebody write about it, let me look into that. I you know like- who's all over at the moment? Arrow from Heavy Artillery. He's like all about Oh, yeah? That. Him and Graffiti Kings are all about, about that at the moment. They're, they're figuring some stuff out. I'm good for them. Yeah, so it's just a whole other world, isn't it? It's a whole podcast in itself. That's what I'm saying. It's just figuring it out the next wave, you know? And I'll ho- hopefully be there to, uh, again, maintain a presence. Yeah, 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 exactly. Where did the name Bio came for, come from, by the way? Where, where, oh, where? I mean, I, this came early on. I, you know, I, I was trying with different names. I was trying V-I-O, yeah. B-I-C. So I had a friend of mine that lived in the projects with me. We were in the stair- stairwell hanging out one day. And he had like really good hand style. Like he never became like a known writer, but he had very good hand style. Mm. So he did like, he, he said, why don't you try a BIO, like combine two of the names I had. Mm. He, he did like a bio tag. And when I looked at the letters together in his hand style, I was like, damn, that's pretty dope. I said, I, I'm going to run with that. So I kind of stuck with that. It was like a fusion of two other names that I was trying at the time you know, before I committed to something. Yeah, it's an it's it's an interesting one. I mean, for for what the letters are, you you really have honed it and made it your own. It's a the, the I and the O that they're, they're workable, yeah. but you've got to you you've got to know the letters, haven't you? Yeah, you know it's funny though. For years that I struggled with it. It's like I was like I don't have a style. I don't have an identity with my letters. Like because I would see other writers and you know they their style fits into a certain look hmm. and then i was like every time i paint is something different i don't i can't find my <laughs> oh man i bet that is like the gold that everyone searches for in graph and then i realized that that became that became my day where i don't kind of stick to the same obviously it looks because it's done by the same hand it has the looks yeah. of my work but the styles are different sometimes the colors the fill-ins i don't know it's just something that happens it's not even something planned i just i've never been able to stay in one niche do you think that's what keeps you wanting is that that you feel like you haven't achieved that echelon of style that you can that makes it identifiable to and you're happy in well listen man listen i came to terms with that's not gonna happen for me (laughs) (laughs) i just keep painting whatever happens happens yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why worry about what you can't control? Yeah, I'm like, I've come to church, I'm good. This is my style. I have all, I can do all, I'll do all the styles. Oh, brother, you kill it. Honestly, a pioneer, pioneer. Who, who are you looking out for at the moment? Who, 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 who measures in, in, you know, in kudos in the mind of bio? Who, who's out there that you're like, yo, like, yeah, they, they're doing their thing? Oh, legally and legally. Artists? Yeah. I mean, I just saw there's an artist, I don't know, I think he's from Spain, right? Caesar. Yeah. I don't know if he's an old cat, young cat, but his, some of his like gimmicks and some of his like works are pretty good. There's Crazy. Guy, 
Miedo, I think another guy from Spain, mm. pretty dope style. You know, there's a lot. There's so many, like, it's hard, like, so many artists around the world. You know, you got guys like Odia from Portugal who's doing like those 3D anamorphic kind of fucking work where shit is no. jumping up from corner to corner. So it, it, it's crazy. That Mediterranean vibe at the moment, they are coming out with some pretty, like, it just feels funk and energy, don't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and for me, it's like, damn, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a, I mean, there was a point where I'm like, the work has gotten so, you know, high quality that I'm like, why do I even bother? Ah, <laughs> and, not hearing you know, it. You know what I mean? You know, <laughs> it, it's like, damn, you motherfucker's a beast. You know what? <laughs> I, I, I must admit, as a beatboxer, uh, I definitely look at the scene nowadays, and I think to myself, damn, like, it's, um, it's, it's. It's so fine tuned that it's almost folded in on itself, and you're like, "How could anybody?" You know, what I mean? it's like, "How the fuck?" How is this human sure possible? Yeah, yeah, it's not for us, like, and I just, you know, one hand I feel extremely grateful to have been part of that organism, but at the same time, I'm like, would I get into it now? It could. How would you even begin to? <laughs> it's crazy. Even if you look at B boys, some of the stuff they're doing like the dancers yeah. I, I look i look at them and i'm like damn damn like, these, these motherfuckers are levitating and shit yo i'm telling you bro even the here's one thing about b-boying right now is even the fucking beats that they're working with even the beats that they're moving to yeah break dance but it's not it ain't about break beats no more it's like they're on some other shit yeah that's what i'm saying it, it's evolved to the point where if you took somebody from back then and they're looking, they're like, I can't do any of that shit. <laughs> and I wonder, I often think to myself, you know, what would the 18-year-old, because, you know, we got into it through youthful wisdom and I'm like, what do people, do, you know, how do, how, how do they think about this? How do they think about this? What process do they have in their head of like, yeah, I'm just going to pick up, pick up the can or yeah, I'm just going to replicate this, what this breakdown said. And when it's so clearly definitive and you, it's hard to deconstruct, it's, that's mad, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I think, again, like in everything, it's all an evolution and it's you picking up something at a point that it's evolved. Just like for me, I, when I, when we started, obviously you had the pioneers before us who, who started out with the, a simple tag with dots in it mm. and a cloud. Yeah. And then the next guy came and did added 3d and added a, a cloud background bubble. And then we picked it up from that point and elevated it to whatever point we were going to elevate it. And then the, the generation that follow after us take it from the point where we left off at they, they're grabbing it at the highest point and then taking it somewhere else, you know? So it's, I think it's the same for all other genres, you know, whether you're a DJ, you you see somebody scratching, you know, obviously the first guy who invented the scratch couldn't do the stuff that's being done now. Mm. But for a young kid coming up now, seeing what's being done now, like, all right, that's his starting point. Your high point is his starting point. It's only going to get fucking higher and higher and <laughs> So you don't even recognize it. It's like, is that what is that? Yeah, like some Martian or land down. You was previously here in 1983, kind of comes back fucking <laughs> 30, 40 years later and be like, yo, what the f-? Crazy. At, at the same time, bio, I feel like, you know, for I mean, and then and let me put it in context why I come in this in this steer in this way is because you guys for me, as as somebody that was super into the New York sound of Onyx, DITC, Beat Miners, you know, EPMD, more business than a personal era. You guys were the, you know, Tats were the, that you guys were my visual representation of Graph in that time. And it feels to me like only you guys can own the standards and quality of that. Bio can only be bio. You know, no one else can copy that. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, I guess that's what it is, you know, that same same way we cannot be the guys from the 70s, you know, we cannot, we are who we are, we're, we, that's who, and we, you own it, and that that's what makes it unique, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it does. 
And it's, honestly, man, it's been a fucking pleasure chatting with you, brother. Listen, I'm glad we got to do this. Thank you for having me, and I wish you all the best, man. Brother. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. A walk in the park, a walk in the cribs, and a, and a life of <laughs> bio tats crew. Hold tight, my brother. <laughs> Killer Keller podcast striking again with a vengeance. Don't forget sharing his care and tell a friend to tell a friend, all right? Killer Keller podcast. We are like him was out of fashion. Peace. Peace.